right, so let me ask, how many have already made a New Year's resolution? Hands up. Got two, three. All right, for the rest of you, I'm going to suggest a New Year's resolution for you. Are you ready for this? It's called holiness. Now, I know that's not on anybody's list. It just is not. Holiness, uh, holiness means uh, uh, to make something very special. Very, very special. You dedicate it, and, and uh, it's a dedicated something. Now, a, a lot of homes have what I would call holy dishes. They're placed in a special cabinet called the china cabinet. Because you only use those holy dishes on very special occasions. And now if they got silver trim or lining on them, you wouldn't even put them in the dishwasher because it'll make little marks on that silver. So you, you hand wash them where you just throw all the others in, in the dishwasher or, or you, you take your paper plates and you just throw them away. But not with china. You hand wash them, you put them in their own cabinet and they're all on display because the word holiness means to set apart for God to be special. And I want you to think about today actually being very special, okay? Hey, this year we're going to be having a Bible memory verse for the month. And the Bible memory verse I have for this month is found in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. You'll notice there in the heart, it's got a Bible verse 2, Psalm 119, 11. It says, I have written your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so the whole idea is I, I memorize the word so that I don't even have to have my Bible. I don't have to whip it out. don't have to pull out my phone and look up, you know, the Bible on my phone. I just know it. And this is the verse I have for January, and it is this. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. You always say the address because you've got to remember that too. You've got to know where it's at in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. So say that with me, all right? I want to hear it loudly, all right? 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. That's not that long, is it? Now, if you repeat that every day this week, by next week, you might have it down. But if you repeat that every day this month, I guarantee you by the end of the month, you will have that verse down. And why am I picking that verse? The reason why we're memorizing is because Bethany needs you in 2022. That's going to be our theme. We need you. Now, looking around today, because of the snow and the new year, it's obvious we need you because our, our ranks are very thin. But that's not really what I want to focus on. Important as that is, we really do need you to come and be a part of the fellowship because there's more to church than just watching a service. There's a fellowship among God's people. We know that from the book of Acts. But that's not really what I want to focus on. What I really want you to do in, uh, in this year, uh, having Bethany as your focus, we want you to believe in the Lord, okay? Now, as soon as I say believe in the Lord, the question then becomes, what does it mean to believe in the Lord. Now, back during uh, the Reformation time, uh, there was a reformer by the name of Martin Luther, and uh, he was studying the book of Romans where it says the just shall live by faith, and that triggered to him what in the world is going on in the church. They're saying you can buy somebody out of purgatory by selling indulgences, and this just did not line up with the scriptures. And so he started to explore the just shall live by faith. It's about faith. And finally, he took a stand uh, on the scriptures that the scripture teaching takes priority over all other teaching. He said, sola scriptura, the scriptures alone. And, and so the reformers began to really zero in. And the reformers of Geneva, Switzerland, Farrell, Calvin, Beza, Knox, they all recognized theologically that there are actually three essential ingredients to believing. The first essential ingredient is notitia. Notitia. I have in your fill-in-the-blank notes there, 
just simply had faith. Had faith. You got to know something to believe before you can believe it. In fact, in the book of Hebrews 11:6 it says anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. So you start believing in this case believing in God. That's the object of your faith. You see, there must be an object of faith. You must have something in which to place your faith to believe in. Even the atheist believes in something. The atheist believes in, well, how did, how did everything come to pass? Well, there was a big bang. So immediately they believe in the miraculous. They do. They believe in miracles. That everything came out of nothing. Or they believe in a miracle that everything always, forever, eternally was in a little tiny compressed speck that for some unknown cause just exploded and became... You see, they have an object in their mind of what they believe. It always starts with your head, you, you have some object that you place your faith in. And so it begins with notitia in the Latin, a head faith, a head faith. A second ingredient is a census. It's a heart faith. It, it's a scent, giving a, 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 a credence to uh, that particular thing that you know. In the book of Romans, it says in the 10th chapter this, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Oh, that's notitious faith. Because you have this head faith, you are confessing with your mouth something you know in your head. But then he adds, and believes in his heart. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's two ingredients there. I often say some people miss heaven by 12 inches. The distance between their head and their heart. You can know it, notitia, all up here. But do you truly believe it and give full assent to that as that is what you believe? And this passage says you have the second ingredient. You know something and you agree to the truth of that. You truly believe it. And you go to the third element. Your faith must also include fiducia. Fiducia. Trust faith. Trust faith. Now, in the book of Acts, Luke records the true story of the Apostle Paul and Silas on a missionary journey. And as usual, whenever they went to a new town, Paul and Silas wind up in jail because what they preach is offensive to whoever is listening. Somebody doesn't like it and tries to get them incarcerated. Well, they wind up in the Philippian jail. And they're singing praise to God. They're singing hymns and songs. Or, and the psalms from the, the Old Testament, they're singing them. And it's midnight. And all of a sudden, there's this terrible earthquake. The foundation of the whole place is shaken. The doors are sprung open. It says suddenly a violent earthquake. The jailer woke up. It's all shaken up. When he saw that the prison doors were open, he drew out word. And he propped it up. He was about to kill himself, throw himself on it because he thought the prisoners had escaped. And in the Roman Empire, if you are the Roman guard, it's your life for their life. If they escape, it's over for you. Rather than be disgraced to have them do it, he's about to end his own life. It's at that moment that the Apostle Paul shouted out, don't harm yourself. All here. The jailer then comes rushing in and he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, where did he come up with this notion of salvation? Well, apparently he had been listening to the singing that they were singing all night. Perhaps he had even heard the Apostle Paul preaching to know why he was being thrown into this incarceration to begin with. In any case, he runs then, he says, what must I do to be saved? And the Apostle Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, I got that word in identified and highlighted because actually in the Greek New Testament, I think the, the King James Version has a better rendering of it. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. 
in or on, what's the difference? Well, there's two different Greek words for that. Epi is the word upon, and the little word en is the word in. And so what we find here in this text is not in, but literally upon. But in English, it doesn't make sense. You say, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we put believe in because that's our custom. But literally, it's believe upon. Here's the difference. I got a circle. And this is the word in in the Greek language, in. And the word upon is upon. It's not in it. It's really above and on it. Now, if I had the word above, I'd put it even higher up, okay? Because each word has its significance. Here is the whole point. He tells to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my favorite story that I tell about believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ is a guy by, by the name of Jean-Francois Gravelet. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Frenchman, long name. He took a stage name as the Great Blunden. And this is an actual flyer from one of his campaigns and shows all of his feats. And he was the one who crossed the Niagara Falls uh, uh, back some time ago, okay? He's, you can see, as my kids would say, uh, during World War I and World War II, they were the black and white wars because everything was taken in black and white. I mean, you can tell this is a long time ago because the picture's in black and white, okay? He crosses, he crosses the Niagara Falls. He did this several times. He went across with a wheelbarrow. There's an actual photograph. He's crossing the Niagara Falls with a wheelbarrow. Hey, he does it at one stop. He takes a table along. And, and on the table, he stops, and he has a glass of wine. He pours himself a glass of wine. Hey, other stories are he takes a little tiny stove across, and he makes an omelet, and he drops it down to the maid of the mist for someone there to have the omelet, and, and then he proceeds across. Well, he's doing this feat, and he goes across this one day. And as he gets across, he says to the crowd, do you believe I could do that again? And they all are cheering, of course, yes, yes, we believe you could do it again. And he says, do you believe I could do it again with someone on my back? And they're all cheering, yeah, yeah. I mean, this guy's going to do something really wild and crazy. So he finds the ringleader, yeah, 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 we, we believe. He's motioning, we believe. And he turns to the man, he says, you, sir. If you believe, will you come and get on my back? And he said, ooh, I believe you can do it. No, Tisha, all up here. All right? A census. I, I really believe. That's what he said. I really believe. But no, fiducia. I don't trust you. I don't trust you. Now imagine you were the man. And he said to you, will you come and get on my back? And you had no Tisha faith. You had a census faith. And you also had fiducia faith. You trust him. And you go over and climb on your back. You say, no one would do that. That is not true. His manager did it. His manager climbed on his back. He was literally upon him. Not just believing in him, he was trusting upon him. Now imagine you are that guy. You're the manager. You're on his back and he's going across. You are literally trusting his skills completely to save you from doom below. That is fiducia trust. Where you substitute, you take, you take Blunden out of the picture and you put Jesus Christ there, and you say, Jesus, I am trusting you to save me completely from my sins and take me to heaven. It's not anything I can do. It's all upon you. That is what the Reformers called faith. Faith. You need all three. You need notitious to believe the facts that he died, was buried, and rose again. That's head faith. You need a census faith to believe in a deep conviction that he did that for you and that he will save you. And you need fiducia faith. You need to place all your trust in him as your savior and make him the Lord of your life. That is biblical faith. 
Bethany needs you in 2022 to believe in the Lord like that. And Bethany needs you in 2022 to believe in his word. It is word. There it is, the scriptures, the scriptures. We need to believe that his word is inspired. That word inspired is from the King James. It's translated in the modern translations as God breathed. It says, all Scripture is God-breathed, so that the Bible is the very Word of God that's been spoken and written for us. It's a verbal communication from God. Bethany needs to believe in the Word of God in 2022. Listen, all Scripture, it says, not just some, but all of it. Now, personally, I like red-letter editions of the Bible. You know what I'm talking about? Red-letter editions, where all the words of Jesus are in red. It just makes it pop out of the page for me. But I want to tell you, the black letters are just as inspired as the red letters because it is all the Scriptures. Listen, I know it's really a lot easier to read the narrative passages and the parables than the genealogies. Do I get an amen there? I mean, when you come across a name like Mahershala Hashbaz, that's pretty hard to say. Or Ish Bibinab, all these these big names in the Bible. Uh, My goodness, you tend to want to skip over them. Am, am, Am I the only one? No, no. But all Scripture is inspired of God. It's God breathed. God, God put that there for a purpose. I may not know the purpose why that genealogy is there, but some scholars said, oh, look, this is here for this purpose so that we can connect the dots in the age in which we live to develop the history, the context in which it all took place. Listen, every word is inspired of God. It's God breathed. Now, notice the text says it's useful. All of it's useful. Every bit of it is useful. So I don't want to really skip over. I want to just just work my way and fight my way through the text uh, when I got those long lists of names that I can't pronounce. And I just make my way because it is useful for teaching. I skip, let me go back. For teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Listen, when I read the word, I'm taught by the Word. When I read the Word, it rebukes me. It points out things in my life that I need to change. It also corrects me and gives me the right thing to do. And as I do it, it trains me in righteousness so that the man of God, speaking of all of us, woman of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God has something for you to do And when you're in the Word, you're better equipped to do what He has for you to do. The Word is also superintended by God. In 2 Peter, it says this, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came by the prophet's own interpretation. The prophets didn't make this stuff up. They didn't. He goes on, For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. Man did not think this up. But the men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We have a hot tub in the backyard. And uh, when the grandkids come over, they like to do something that's kind of fun. We build paper or cardboard boats and we put them in the hot tub. And if the jets are on, they're all over the place. Why? Because those jets are taking the water everywhere, and wherever the boat goes, or the water goes, that's where the boat goes. And so they'll go, and they'll collide into each other, and and then we got this game that we play, which one will last the longest? Well, then uh, it's kind of like when the other person's not looking, you're pushing their boat underwater, and so because you want yours to be the longest. But the whole idea is, Those boats are carried along by the water. If I turn off the jets, the boats stop. But when I turn the jets on, the water's moving, so the boats are moving. Men, 
I'm, I think that's me. These men, <laughs> I got to quit being animated. These men <laughs> were carried along by the Holy Spirit. They were like the pen, the men were like the pen in the Holy Spirit's hand as the pen was in the prophet's hand. God had prepared each individual to write what they wrote using their own personalities, kind of like writing with a blue pen, putting it down, picking up a black pen, putting it down, picking up a red pen. God picked up the Moses pen and he wrote for a while. God picked up the Apostle pen for a little while. God then picked up Peter as the pen, and each one has their own characteristics because God providentially structured their whole lives, their whole experiences, so that when they wrote the Scriptures, the Scriptures were the very words that God wanted written. Wow. His word is inerrant. Inerrant. By that we mean there are no errors in it as it came from the hand of God. On the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, do you get that? He never has to use a whiteout and say, oops, I made a mistake, I wasn't truthful there, i got to correct this. Never. God, who does not lie, he promised salvation, eternal life, before the beginning of times. Listen, the word of God is inerrant. It's also eternal. The word of God is eternal. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, and they're not going to disappear for a long time, the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any ways disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. The Bible, all of its prophecy, all of its promises are going to be fulfilled. And he says it comes right down to the smallest letter. The very first word in the Hebrew Bible is Bereshit. And that has the smallest letter in it. And I'm going to circle it for you right there. It's the smallest little letter, the Yod. It also has a least of the stroke. Now, the least of the stroke, I have right below the resh, I have a Daleth. And on the Daleth, the difference between these two letters is very insignificantly small. It's just a little overhang. Jesus said, not one dot of the I or cross of the T, only referring to it in Hebrew, least of the stroke and the smallest letter, will ever pass until everything in the law is fulfilled. Wow. God's word is forever settled, forever settled, forever settled. His word is also authoritative. By that I mean it has the right to command you. 418 times in the Bible it says, I, I use the New King James Version for this, thus says the Lord. 418 times. Just that little expression alone is saying, this is what God is saying. Can you get any higher authority than that? Not at all. Now, I start out by saying, I wanted you to have a New Year's resolution to be holy. To be holy means to be sacred, to be sanctified. And Jesus said this, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And so today you might have noticed in your bulletin that I included a Bible reading schedule for the year 2022. You can read a little bit every day. That can be your New Year's resolution. You read a little bit. There's two parts to each day. On day one, you got a little bit in Genesis chapters, and you also have a little bit in Matthew. And when you read through the schedule, by the end of the year, you will have read through the entire Bible. It'll take you about 10 minutes a day. 10 minutes a day. And the text says, sanctify them through your, your, your truth. Thy word is truth. Reading the Bible will make you more special, more holy than if you don't. Wow. 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 Now, to, I added to that, we're going to do a Bible memory verse. And, and we've already said it, but I want you to say it with me again. So say it right now. 
1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Very simple. Hiding a word in my heart, reading it daily, it'll make me more holy, more special, because God's word will be in my life. little simple thing that you can do. So I want you to believe in the Lord. I want you to believe in his word. And I want you to believe in his work. The work of the Lord Jesus Christ is the church. Now, let me back up just for a moment. Years ago in a previous church, uh, the very first Sunday of the year, I preached on reading through your Bible in a year. Okay? And uh, several people took me up on that and they did that. And come around, I guess it was about August because I was stopping at one of the members' home one of the older members of the church, and she had a garden, and she would give me some things out of her garden. She asked me to stop by, and I stopped by, and she said, can you come in for a moment? And I said, sure. So I step in, and she had on her dining room table a Bible, and it was a pretty new Bible, pretty nice Bible, and, and she said to me, she said, uh, I just wanted you to see my Bible, and I looked at the Bible. Oh, yeah, this is a wonderful Bible. It's a great Bible, and she said, yeah. I, I said, she said, well, this is a really special Bible. I never owned a Bible before. And she said, well, you know, you preached on reading through your Bible in a year on the beginning of January. And she said to me, and uh, I knew I needed to do that, except I can't read. I can't read. And so what she did, because the Spirit of God moved in her heart, she said, I hired a lady to come and teach me to read so that I could read my Bible. She said, when the lady arrived, she asked her, why do you want to read? And she said, because I want to read the Bible. And she said, okay, then let's get a Bible. So she bought a Bible. So her first meeting, she opened up the Bible and she taught her how to read out of the Bible. Listen, that just convicts me so much. I know how to read. I know how to read. You know how to read. I have a Bible. I have the Word of God. I have the ability. And yet, I don't have the desire like she had to pick up that skill in order to read. That's all she wanted to read so she can hear from God. You can read through the Bible in a year or just do one half or the other. Read through the Old Testament or read through the New Testament. Make it a two-year plan. All right, or so you read and you miss a few days. Okay, so you're going to be off. You can make this a three-year plan. That's okay. It's okay. You just need to read, read, read. You will be a more holy, you will be a more special person if you read the Word of God. You will be. Moving on to believe in the church. Bethany needs you in 2022 to believe in his work, and his work is the church. I know that because Jesus said, I will build my church. We call ourselves a Jesus-built church because we are taking as our model the biblical principle that Jesus is the one who builds the church. He's the head of the church. He's the builder. His tools are you and me. We are the tools that he's using to reach and touch other people's lives with the good news of Jesus Christ. We are the tools in his hands, but he is doing his work primarily in the age in which we live through the church. He said, I will build my church. Now, the context was very simply this. Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? It's very interesting because of this. I, I took a video camera and went onto the streets when I was in Muskegon, and I took video shots of people. I'd ask her permission. I'd say, hey, I want to do this at church. I've got a question I want to ask you. I, uh, I'll you know, shoot the video, and then if it's okay with you, then I'll present it in a thing that I'm doing at church. So people would say yes. And I, I just simply ask, uh, who is Jesus? And oh my goodness, the answers that I got were like far out, really crazy. 
from a good person to I don't know to uh, a miracle worker. Uh, some of them, every now and then, I would get someone who would say, Jesus is the Son of God. I wasn't the first one to do this. Who is Jesus? Jesus was the first one to do. Who is Jesus? Who do people say that the Son of Man is? That's a favorite term that he has for himself, Son of Man. If you search the scriptures, you'll find that it goes back to Daniel chapter 7. It's a messianic title for the coming Messiah who's going to rule over the earth. So he says, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now he knows he's the Son of Man. And they say, well, some of, them are, some of the people are saying that you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Some are saying you're Elijah, some Jeremiah, and some saying, well, one of the other prophets, that somehow he's one of them. And then Jesus focuses right on his group of 12, and then he says, don't tell me about the rest of the people. Who do you say I am? Who do you say that he is? Then Peter, as a spokesperson for the group, I think, Simon Peter answers, you are the Christ, the anointed, the Messiah. The son of the living God, you are deity come in the flesh. Wow. 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 Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed that unto you, but my Father in heaven, God has worked in your heart to say that. That is the confession upon which our church is built. <laughs> Jesus built, you got a confession. Then you move from there to the great commandment. And the great commandment, you know the story. Uh, they were trying to trap Jesus. And one of the experts in the law, uh, he tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus answered, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind this is the first and the greatest commandment. It comes from the Old Testament itself. A couple times in the Bible it refers to loving the Lord your God with all your heart. And he says, this sums it all up. You love the Lord with all your heart. You will fulfill all the Old Testament says, all the laws. You'll just automatically do them because you love the Lord. It's not because you got to, it's because now you want to. You love the Lord. He says, you put the Lord first in your life. And we, our church that believes in that, we put the Lord Jesus first in our, our church and it's all that we do. And he said, and the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. In the Luke account, the, the guy then tries to justify himself. And he says, well then, who is my neighbor? I mean, that's pretty hard. How, how, who's my neighbor? And he tells the most famous story. I mean, there's hospitals named after this. The Good Samaritan, right? There, this is the most, one of the most famous stories in the Bible where, where you know, there's the, the priest and the Levite go by and they find this guy that's been beaten up on the side of the road and they just pass on by. And then comes along the Samaritan and his audience knows Samaritans are, are hated. Uh, uh, there, there's, they have a prejudice towards them. But the Samaritan sees this Jewish guy all beat up and he takes and he... He ministers to him, and that ministry to him, and, 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 and he takes, he pours in oil and wine in his wounds, and he bandages and puts him on his donkey, takes him to an inn, and there, there he's kept, and he's got to go on his way, but he says to the innkeeper there, he says, take care of him, and if there's anything that is owed, I'll pay it when I come back the next time. It's called like paying it forward or something like that. And, and so he, he does that. And, and, and then Jesus says, uh, so tell me, who was his neighbor? Ooh, his neighbor was the guy that helped him. And he says, go do likewise. Listen, we have all of our ministries from open door to blessings in a pack, backpack and all these things that we do because we are a Jesus-built church, built on the great confession, built on the great commandment. That's why we have a worship service, loving the Lord our God. Then we'll, why we have all those ministries. We're, we're trying to love our neighbor as ourselves. But then there's a third ingredient to a Jesus-built church, and it is the great commission, the great commission. There, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. A disciple is a follower when I have a baptism class and we go over this with the kids, we'll play 
follow the leader. All right? And everybody wants to be a leader because you walk around and the kids follow. A disciple is someone who is following the leader. Listen to this. Jesus said, go be the leader. Find someone who will follow you. Be the leader. Take the lead. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age. Wow. So here we are at the beginning of a year. I got the January calendar up there. We're at the beginning of a year, a new year, 2022. I want to suggest that we begin the year by believing in the Lord. Not just with our head, not simply with our heart and our head, but also with our will, trusting the Lord, trusting the Lord. I want to suggest that we begin this year by believing in his word enough to say, I am going to read your word. You don't have to use my schedule. Use any schedule. Use the daily bread schedule. Use any schedule. Get into the word. Get into the word on a daily basis. Let's begin the year by believing in his church, in his church, that God is still using his church to impact the world for Jesus Christ. You see, Bethany needs you to believe in 2022. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word that teaches us how to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, about the word itself, and Lord, the work that you're involved in, the church. We pray, Father, that uh, we will be a people who will gather here. Lord, that we will not be deterred from our desire to be in fellowship with God's people because we believe you are the Lord, we believe in your word, and we believe in your church. Help us share our faith, Lord, Share with people so that they are followers of us and they follow us in our walk. We can say, do as I do because I'm following in the steps of Jesus. Help us, Lord, to share our faith. This I pray in Christ's name. Amen.